Today is going to be a little different. I'm going to do, uh, you know, we've been going through the Romans series, and I'm going to uh, be going through Romans 13. There's only 14 verses in Romans 13. So it's not going to take very long to go through it. And in fact, I'm kind of going to, in a way, rush through it because there's more current events that I kind of want to talk about today and some prophetic things uh, that's come about in the last uh, week or two weeks, I guess. And so uh, I want to just kind of spend more time actually on that and as we go through Romans 13. But I'm going to go through Romans 13 again pretty quickly. So let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to Romans 13. And we're going to read the first seven verses. And it says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do what is right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to you for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you are to pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So basically that whole first section is saying, you know, we must submit to or be subject to or, in other words, obey uh, the government who has righteous laws. And sometimes God gives good leaders as a blessing, obviously. And sometimes he gives evil rulers as a means of judgment and even of trial or testing. And to give you another view, First Peter uh, 2, 13 through 17, just to give you another view, saying the same thing from the Apostle Peter, he says, submit yourself to the Lord. For the Lord's sake, to every authority, institution among men, whether to kings and the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God and honor the king. Now, I know honoring the king is not always easy, whether we call it a president. But we are to do that, to honor the, the king or the president or the leader of, the, of a nation. Now, it's interesting, I'm just going to, you don't have to turn there, but in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel, you know, after Nebuchadnezzar has one of his dreams, and then Daniel tells him, he says, he, meaning God, he changes times and seasons, he removes kings, and he sets up kings. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was not a good guy. He was a pagan, he was cruel, 
but yet God uses him for his purposes. And then in, in Dan, Daniel chapter 4, after Nebuchadnezzar went through that period where, you know, Daniel had warned him about pride, he didn't humble himself, and so for seven seasons, most believe it's seven years, he ate grass like an animal, lost his mind basically, and then after the end of the seven years, God restored him. And then Nebuchadnezzar writes a letter to his whole kingdom, and he says, the sentence that was applied to him, talking about the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the words of the Holy One, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whom he will. So think about this. Without civil government, we would have anarchy. And anarchy is worse than no government or than any other type of government it, because it's lawlessness. And that's what you kind of have like in Haiti right now. Lawlessness reigns. So anarchy, we don't want. So even if it's a bad government, many times the laws they put in place keep down the evil, basically, because of punishment. Now, chapter 12, we learn that Christians must not take personal revenge, but we are to turn the punishment over to civil authorities who do have that responsibility to punish evildoers. And Christians should pay their taxes even if some of the money is used unjustly or unrighteously, but we should still pay our taxes. Now, here's the exception. And, and think about this. And Paul's writing this at the time where he's under the Roman Empire. Not the most godly government. You know, right? But here's the exception. We're not required to obey the government when it causes us to disobey God's commandment. Okay? So, like in Acts chapter 5... Let me turn over real quick. Acts chapter 5, give you an example of the apostles. After they had uh, been uh, kept, or uh, the high priest has sent his uh, soldiers to arrest them, basically. And then in verse 27 through 29, so having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. So when we bump up against the situation where the government comes against what God's laws are, we are obviously to stand with God's laws. A couple of other uh, examples, you know, you think of, of Moses' parents, like in Hebrew, uh, actually, in, yeah, Hebrews 11, verse 23. Remember when Pharaoh put the edict out that all the male children who were born were to be killed. Okay, but the midwives and also Moses' parents didn't follow that despite the threat to them, what might happen to them. And then in, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 12, is where, remember, where the wise men are coming. Jesus has been born. They're coming to find the new king to worship him. And they go to Herod, and Herod tells them, yeah, you go, and uh, when you find him, come back and tell me, so I may go and worship him. Although, obviously, his plan was to go kill him. So the wise men were warned in a dream not to go back that way, not to go back to Herod. So they disobeyed his, his orders and went back by a different way. And then we can take a more modern day, you know, World War II type times where bon, Dietrich Bonhoeffer resisted the Nazis 
and what Germany was standing for at the time, and it ended up costing him his life. So we have examples throughout Scripture and modern times. All right, so let's go on to verse 8. We're going to go 8 through 10. Is this picking up all right? Okay. It says, let no debt remain outside except the continued debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandment, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfillment of the law. Now, when it says, oh, no one anything, you know, that's not a prohibition against uh, getting a loan. What it is is that you pay back the loan. Kind of not like the student loan situation. You should pay the loan back, right? Also, uh, the law is the fulfillment of the law or the Torah by loving your neighbor. If, you, if you're doing that out of true love, you've, com you've fulfilled the law. Okay, 11 through 14. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has come for do you wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us not behave, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies, and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature so again from chapter 12 and chapter 13 from there on it, it again paul is kind of turning from doctrine to okay now this is how you live this is how you relate to the world this is how you should fulfill as good citizens in whatever nation you are in and it does say be sure to put on the armor so all of you probably remember out of Ephesians I'll just read that Ephesians chapter 6 about the full armor of God in verses 10 through 17 because you have to always realize that the enemy has scanned us he knows what our weaknesses are he knows how to push our buttons He's very familiar with this. So it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and the authorities, against the powers of of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with a, with a belt of truth buckled around your waist with a breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness 
that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With that in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So we are to be good good law-abiding citizens. Again, except when the government's edicts go against what God's edicts are. So in a case to say like abortion, if it was legalized in our state, then we would stand against that. We would support the pregnancy centers. We would fight against the crime, really, of abortion. Or let's talk about same-sex marriage. So the federal government has said it is legal. But the Word of God says marriage is between a man and a woman. So we stand against those things that the federal government or the state government might say is legal, but we stand for righteousness in that. All right. So like I said, I was going to go through that quickly, not spend too much time on it. So we can kind of move on to something else. So I want to go ahead and pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. And, and Lord, your word teaches us how we are to live, how we are to stand in righteousness, how we are to relate to the world, to the government, to our fellow citizens. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we know there's power in your word. So, Lord, I ask that you would just uh, grant your presence now, Lord, and say, Holy Spirit, come. I ask, Lord, for clarity and wisdom, how to share, uh, Lord, the things that you put on my heart. And, Lord, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so in the last couple weeks, I've been hearing both in the natural and in the spirit, spirit or in the spirit both, situation awareness. Now, when we usually think about situation awareness, we think about being aware of your surroundings. When you're going, say, to Walmart, and you're watching things around you, make sure something's not out of place. You may be kind of cognizant of where you're parking, things like that, just aware of things that are going on around you, and especially now and in this season that we're moving into you need to have that situation awareness be listening to the holy spirit but there's another application to it and that is on a larger scale in other words situation awareness of what is going on in our nation and in the nations of the world so the Lord's been speaking that over and over again. So it's interesting how sometimes the Lord leads you in different ways. So in this last, probably now it's been two months, the Lord has led me to some books. We were down in, um, we went to Texas to see our kids, and we stopped off in uh, Dallas and uh, to see my cousin, we stayed the night with her before we went on down to see our son and, and our great grandkids. And we were just talking, and, and she was telling me about a book she just had read. And it was uh, Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel's uh, autobiography. She said it was a pretty big book, and it is a pretty big book. But it's interesting because it goes through 
basically where we are now, up to now. In fact, he probably wrote this a little too soon because it's obviously he's prime minister now and things are still going on. But it gave me a great understanding of what has happened in the past, okay? I remember being there uh, actually in Jerusalem the day that Arafat died on November 11, 2004. And the riots, we were actually supposed to go to the Temple Mount that day and couldn't go because they were throwing rocks and everything else at us. So we weren't able to, to make it up there. But it gave me, uh, like say, understanding of where they have come from since after the 67 war. We just got a, uh, in fact, this morning, got an email from a friend of ours who, uh, Canada, she was one who was involved with a CRI, Crisis Response International, that we were good friends with. And they've been living in Jerusalem for probably eight or eight years, probably. And, um, and so they were giving us updates on what was happening. And they were running back and forth to the bomb shelters, you know, because the rockets, you know, would come. And, uh, and so they're praying what they should do. Should they stay or should they go? And then after praying, they felt like they are to go. And then once they made that decision, there was another ministry who contacted them and gave them a way out, basically. So she was actually emailing from the airport uh, in Tel Aviv. And they were on their way uh, to, they didn't have a choice where to go, but they were going to Tampa. That's where they're going to be flown. Also has some friends, uh, Alvin Boski, who used to be one of the pastors uh, before IHOP. Um, and they've been there probably 20 years. They live in the south, and so we kind of get updates from them also. But in reading through that book, I, you know, I find out how they're, how like Hamas, their strategies, okay? Like they will, um, well, one thing, Hamas, Hezbollah, the PLO, uh, Islamic Jihad, they all have within their charters, okay, the destruction of Israel. So the first thing is, how are you ever going to be able to negotiate with somebody who their charter says, we're going to destroy you? And it's interesting how Hamas will use, uh, they use schools and hospitals and mosques to store their weapons. That way, if they are bombed, then, you know, the world opinion turns against it. So we are, you're destroying schools and hospitals. But they always give warnings before, Israel always gives warnings before they rocket or where they bomb. Uh, say it's a, a hospital or school or a mosque, whatever it is, or a house. They get plenty of warnings so people can get out. They're going to destroy that building. So, so what they like to do, they like to hide behind civilians. And actually, they don't really care if they're killed because that help turns world opinion against Israel because they're showing on the news innocent people, you know, getting killed. In fact, as Israel, as you probably know, has recently told from all of them in the south of Gaza to, to get out. And, or to the north of Gaza to go south to get out of that area where they're about to invade. And Hamas is telling them, no, don't leave, you stay. Because they use them basically for, uh, not just for hostages, but as a shield. And when what has happened in the past was, when that would happen, then world opinion would usually turn and then would force Israel to negotiate and usually what happens if they have any hostages you know uh, Hamas or Hezbollah will give up you know one or two soldiers or whoever they captured and Israel would have to give maybe a thousand out of their prisons that were terrorists okay but what happens is 
Then that gives them, say, Hamas or Hezbollah, either one. In a couple of years, they're going to rearm, and the same thing is going to happen again. So you have this same cycle going on. And I think now that's what Israel is saying about Hamas. We need to deal with this so that it never raises its head again. But that's going to be, you know, you got a couple million people in a small area. So it's, it's not easy to do. And also read a lot about, you know, if you remember back, actually started clear back with Reagan where he talked about they wanted to trade land for peace. The Israel had the Gaza Strip. That was Israel's territory. But as part of the deal, trading peace for land, they gave up, they gave up the Gaza Strip, and they also had some uh, uh, Jewish settlements that were within the Gaza Strip, and they also had to give up the West Bank. Now, while Netanyahu was in, because he had been pres- you know, a prime minister several different times, and he would never do that, but the one who followed him did, and as a result, what happened? There was no peace. Peace never comes. So it puts them in a very hard place. And so now we are who we are. Land for peace. And there's another time after, again, after in between where he was prime minister and then someone else and back in the 90s, became prime minister. Pressure was so great, and especially on the Clinton years, there's a lot of pressure, again, for peace, that you must give up land. So they made an agreement to give up everything and give Arafat what he wanted. And he refused. Why? Because the only thing he had to do was give up his, that charter that said, we will stop, you know, we will no longer have it in our charter that we're, going, we're, we're existing basically to destroy Israel. And he wouldn't do it. So you, you can kind of see that this is a very volatile situation. Hezbollah has yet, which is in the north in Lebanon, has not yet really, they've, they've been changing some fire, but they have not, you know, fully come into the war. And if that was to happen... Uh, that would uh, obviously increase a lot more casualties, a lot more damage on both sides. So I want you to think about something. So what God, how should I say this? Thursday we were in cleaning. This it was our week, our week to do the cleaning, and Debbie and Glenn and I were there. and So Glenna was dusting over the bookshelf so because i talked about three books okay so he brings his book over to me says you might be interested in this and it said israel and the time of jacob's trouble and it's by art katz now i'm very familiar with art katz because i remember seeing him back in the 80s he came also had a book by him uh that's called where was God during the Holocaust? Now, he was a Jewish intellectual who became a Christian who uh, became a pastor and, and wrote several books. And like I say, the book I had was uh, Where Was God During the Holocaust? And it was hard to read. And gave it to some, I think I gave it to Nathan. He read it. Gave it to Scott McCollum, he read it, and I think uh, Chad and Jesse Getz have it now. And in this one, I just want to read how it starts. He says, I have the unwelcome task of giving an overview of what the scripture calls the time of Jacob's trouble. It is a painful survey of the devastation and suffering yet future for Israel and the Jewish people. But I think that the church needs to have this view 
brought into its understanding, lest it finds itself offended at the lengths to which God will go in dealing with this Jacob nation, in order that they might finally become the true Israel of God. I've always said the things that he says only a Jew could say because the Gentile was to say that, not be good. So what he's saying is God has a purpose, even in what's happening with Hamas. They, they're demonically inspired, but God uses things like that. Look at their past. God used the Syrians to come down in, in 722 B.C. and destroy the northern ten kingdoms of Israel. Wiped it off. And then 586 B.C., Babylon, another evil, cruel people, were brought in and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, deported the people back to Babylon, took them, the survivors as slaves. And then in 70 AD, we have the same thing, except it's the Roman Empire that comes in, destroys the temple, takes Jerusalem. The people, Jewish people are scattered, the survivors are scattered across the nation. So what he's saying is this same pattern is probably going to happen again. His point is there is another, another holocaust coming for the Jewish people. And not just for the ones in Israel, but for the ones that are scattered throughout the nation. And obviously, there's probably more here in the United States than any other nation. And so we need to stand with them, support them, but at the same time realize that God has his purposes, which to our mind is really offensive. You know, Mike Bickle always had a statement. He said, God will use the least severe method to produce the greatest amount of love. And it's like that with this situation. God's going to produce something. He's going to bring forth in the future. Remember Romans 11 where it said, all Israel will be saved. For that to happen, unfortunately, it's going to be a remnant of survivors so do not be surprised that we've seen the end of this thing whether this war ends soon or whether it does not end soon there are hard and severe times coming for the nation of Israel but we need to support we need to pray for them mostly we need to pray for their salvation that they have rejected. Remember how Jesus, he gave all the different parables, and he gave the parables about Israel's leadership. He said, the kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to another. And he tells them, you know, he's, on the, he's carrying the cross, you know, on the way to, on the way to his crucifixion. And the, the women are, are uh, you know, weeping, crying out. And he turns to them and says, daughters of Jerusalem, don't, wait, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself for what's coming on you. And that came on them in 70 AD. So in the midst of all this and what we see, you know, in that micro picture, there's a, a, a macro, there's a bigger picture going on of what God is doing with that nation. So, again, we need support. We need to pray for them. And there may come a day when you have to stand with them in persecution. You may come a day where you may have to hide Jews again. We don't know what that all looks like. But at the same time, do not be offended at what God does and he allows to happen. All right, so now let's move from Israel to the United States. 
So last Sunday, after church, I had a meeting with a group that we get together with probably twice a year. They were all members of, of Crisis Response International. And we were discussing what was going on in the world. And we all had this same warning that was within us. What we saw happen in Israel is going to be happening here. It's coming. Talk about a third book. This is by William Fortune called The Day of Wrath. I read this. This was written in 2014. I read it back then. I haven't thought about it, you know, really since. And then about a month ago, I've got several books I'm trying to read. And then it's like the Lord says, get that book. You need to reread it. So I asked Glenna if she knew where it was. I thought we had it, but I wasn't for sure. Yes, we did have it. And so I read it. And very sobering. He's actually writing it as a novel. If you don't know who he is, how many of you have ever heard of the book One Second After? Anybody? Okay. One Second After was a book that he wrote. Uh, wrote back, and I don't know even what year that was, but it was one second after was about a what would happen, and he made it in a as a novel, but all the facts that he used were true. It was about what would happen if an EMP, an electric magnetic pulse, and what that is is where someone can burst a nuclear weapon above the United States. There's no damage from the nuclear weapon itself. But it's an electromagnetic pulse that fries all the grid, fries all your electronics, and in one second, you go from living in 2023 to living in the, in the 1800s or the 1700s because there's no electricity. And during that time, he goes through a, a year period, 90-some percent of the population dies because we don't know how to live like that, right? So that book had such an impact that Congress had hearings about it and uh, several different hearings using that book to find, start talking about how we need to harden our electrical grid. Unfortunately, ver a little has happened, but very little has happened. So we are still just as vulnerable. So he wrote this book, 2014. This was later. And it's interesting that his, his first, he has a little thing before he even starts. But he says, for those who stand, watch against evil. For the two who told me I must write this book. And for a third who inspired me not to turn back. And then in his forward, his first sentence is, this is a book that I did not want to write. So what happens, because this goes along with what our discussion was last Sunday with this group, because we all had the same sense. What has happened on our southern border There's terrorists have come across, and they have been coming across, and they are terrorist secret cells, violent cells, all across this nation. So we were all feeling, feeling that. You know, since Biden took office, six million have come across the border. Now, recently, they've caught 150 to two who have come from uh, terrorist nations. That's who they caught. How many have come who, obviously, they didn't catch, right? So we were all pondering this, 
And it was interesting because we all had that same feeling and that almost feeling of dread. This is, this is what's coming our way. So I got that book at 1 on Thursday. Friday, this last week, Chris Reed, who's the, um, he's now the CEO and the, and the president of Morningstar Ministries, came out uh, with an emergency warning of a dream he had I believe it was on October 8th he was not uh, he he didn't feel at the time he could release it, so he'd been praying over it but on Friday he released it I think he was also on uh, Sid Roth's show and released it there and you can go to Miller Center Ministry and I would suggest you do just to get the whole depth of of the dream he said it was the most troubling dream he's had he also had one been over probably a year and a half ago about the fifty dollar bill uh, which is basically where it was being torn in half or turning quarters and half basically talking about the economy and what was coming and with inflation and he was you know right about that he actually had one also of his that was from that last december he said there'd be a plane that disappears with sensitive equipment and then it appears they find it, they find it which was that F-35 that was pilot bailed out and because it's a stealth fighter they don't could see it on radar so it crashed and they didn't know where it was for a couple of days they finally found it so he had that almost right and of course it's filled with sensitive equipment so in this stream and I'm not going to give all the details because it, it's pretty long you need to go and if you don't if you can't find it email me and I can email it to you but there are, he saw at least 12 secret sales that are already in place and all they're waiting for they have a way to communicate um, without being detected as far as you know encrypted communications and they're just waiting for the command when where and what they are well financed they're well armed he saw different places he saw michigan he saw one in texas he saw one in uh, i think it was arizona there was one in the carolinas and then in the east coast there were several up there in the northeast like new york and boston all that area up there And so they're, he's saying unless, you know, he's, he's hopeful that prayer could keep us from happening. My personal belief is I don't think it, I, I think it's, it's I think it's going to happen. Rick Joyner had all had several, this was quite a few years back, probably 10 years ago. He had kind of basically the same thing. He had a, a, a dream. And with his, it was people who'd come across the southern border. In fact, that his whole warning from that dream was we need to get the southern border under control. And that was probably 10, 15 years ago. And if we don't, this is what was going to happen. There'd be terrorists coming across from the southern border. And what they would do would be so horrific that it would shock the nation so much that many of the states would turn against the federal government because they have allowed it to happen. And again, in this William Forsythe book, he's not prophesying. He's just writing the facts of what he sees coming. And in this case, it's, it's pretty horrific because they're, they're different terrorists, but it's very similar, very except they, they pinpoint schools and they attack schools in force and then they block the roads and the highways going to it so that they can kill lots of people on the highway, not just in the school, but in the highways and parents who are coming trying to get, you know, of course would, would be panicked going to try to get to their kids at school and it resulted in hundreds and hundreds of, of casualties. And it's very hard. Glenna was reading some of that, and she had to quit because it was just. 
So, also, it was probably Thursday or Friday. Got a message from from Jesse Getz. You know, they're in Atlanta now, hopefully coming back sooner, sooner rather than later. Uh, let me find that. She said, we are praying for Israel too. And yes, I am also sensing that I had a few dreams about a month ago that also hinted that direction. There was an attack and the government used it to take control of everything. I saw Christian persecution, but it led to a great revival. Praying for the body of Christ, I don't believe we are prepared for what is coming, myself included. Help us, Lord. I'm not sure when this will occur, but it is coming. So all these different conf confirmations continue to receive. And again, in that group of probably four or five different couples, we all had that same sensing that this thing is coming. Another little fact, you know, we have 17 days oil supply in the strategic oil reserve. That's the less that's been since the 1980s. Because remember, a year or so ago, when the gas prices were going up, and Biden wanted to get the prices down, so he started using it out of that strategic oil reserve. So now we're down very dangerously low. So my purpose is not to create fear, but just an awareness, again, that situation and awareness of what's going on and what the possibilities are. I think we, first thing is that we need to be spiritually prepared. We need to gird ourselves up. So that when those things begin to happen, we are not shaken. And we're not even surprised. But we are prepared to be the body of Christ. To be there for others. To comfort others. To encourage others in the midst of the shaking. But I think there's also practical preparation you need to have in place. You need to think about water, food, communications, even possibly preparing how would you live without electricity. And there's a lot of other threats besides that. I mean, I talked about the EMP. I mean, that's always a possibility. I mean, that would be one that would pretty well finish our nation. But they can almost do that same thing with cyber attacks now, where they can... Knock the grid off. It wouldn't be as devastating as the EMP. There's possibility of war with China or with Russia or with both at the same time. Our economic conditions are very, very fragile right now. Not to mention, you know, natural disasters. But in the midst of shaking... I believe there's going to be a great move of the Holy Spirit, a great in-gathering people that want to come into the kingdom because people are going to be shaken. They're going to be fearful. They're going to be looking for answers. And that's when they are open to you sharing about Jesus and about eternity. And we also need to think of ourselves as being, it's for such a time as this that you were born, that you have a purpose. God will give you what you need. He will give you uh, everything to be those light in the midst of darkness. So again, my purpose is not to create fear. In fact, you know, if we all read the end of the book, we know that we win at the end, right? 
So whether you live or whether you die, your life is hidden with him. So I want to encourage you this morning to be alert to that, to that um, situation, awareness on a big scale, to be listening, to be asking the Holy Spirit. You know, one of our prayers is that, that Lynn and I pray all the time is that we be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. I think that's a good prayer. Because there may come a time where the Lord says, don't get on that plane. Don't go there. Don't, you know, we need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. But we need to be aware and be, you know, have our feet truly grounded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because times are going to, we're not going to get easier. They're going to get harder. And no one wants to say this. You know, but if you look at the prophets through the Old Testament, who are all the false prophets? All the false prophets said peace and safety. No one wanted to listen to the Jeremiah's, the Ezekiel's, all the different ones. said, better wake up. Judgment's coming. So Lord, I just thank you. Lord, that, that you are preparing your people. Lord, that you have a purpose. And you have a plan. And you are working out that plan, and that purpose. Lord, even when we don't understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, but, Lord, we, we trust you. Trust you, Lord. And we say yes to your leading and your guiding. But, Lord, I pray for this people. Lord, I continue to ask that you would give them visions, dreams, angelic visitation, everything that you have for your people that we begin to walk in, Lord. And Lord, as we see these, these days that are getting darker, Lord, that we will be, as Isaiah 60, arise and shine to let our light shine brightly. And Lord, I pray that we would be in the right place at the right time doing the right. Lord, let this house, this household of faith, let it be a light into this community, into this region. And Lord, we lift up your people Israel, Lord. We pray for safety. We pray for protection. And especially, Lord, I pray for those Messianic believers throughout the land. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, that this would result in a mighty harvest of souls coming into your kingdom. Lord, that you have broken and are breaking the pride of Israel. We have the best defense. We have the best intelligence. And Lord, fortunately, you had to show them that unless you lean upon the Lord, you have nothing. Unless the Lord builds a house. So Lord, we pray for your kingdom to come, your will to be done in that land of Israel. Lord. We pray, Lord, that you'd give us a heart for the Jewish people and at the same time know that your dealings and to us, seem offensive. But Lord, we don't want to be offended at you. The Lord give us understanding, application in these coming days, how we are to respond. 
Lord, again, just pray for your peace. That peace that passes all understanding to cover this people. Lord, that we be awake, but not in a place of fear or anxiety. And we would be those lights that you would have us. And I pray this and ask this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Anybody have any questions? Comments? No, this is not a happy message. Thoroughly? Michael, I think Lonnie have forgot. Do you still want to share something? Thursday night, I was up a little bit later than Debbie. Um, I was watching uh, YouTube. Uh, Perry Stone, I, I enjoyed that, that ministry there. And, and uh, I must not have enjoyed it quite as thought I did because I fell asleep. And this, this old boy can fall asleep pretty easy if he leans back in the recliner and closes his eyes a little bit. You know, it's not, it doesn't take that much for me to fall asleep. But when I woke up, I wasn't reclined. I was sitting straight up. My feet were flat on the floor. My hands were on my knees. And I woke up listening to scriptures. And I guess it had finished his program and just automatically went to something along those lines or something like that. And it was these scriptures, and it just slowly woke me up. And I remember, I don't believe I said it out loud, but I might have done. Just, oh, that's a good one. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord. That, that, you know, my spirit is really being ministered to. But I heard one group of scriptures read twice. Because I heard that, the reference twice. And uh, I want to read that to you, if that's all right. Psalms 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains from where my, shall my help come from. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. And the sun shall not, not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will, the Lord will bless your going out. And you're coming in from this time forth and forever. I'm really thankful for the word that Rod brought. I'm, I'm convinced in my spirit that it is uh, a definite proper warning, a proper encouragement to, to stand. You know, when all else, we've done all we could to stand, we just keep standing. And God's, and God's protection is there with us through all that. He will never leave us, even though it may, it may feel like, Lord, where are you? This is, this is, this is a rough patch I'm, we're going through. But he's, he'll, never, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. I just wanted, that word is not just for, for me. I, I believe it's for others out here. And I just want to encourage you with that. Encourage you with that. Thank you, Lord. Very timely, Michael. Anybody else? If anybody else needs prayer, too, feel free to come up. Um, I'm, I'm sure all of you know this, but I just, I feel like, I mean, even as Rod was talking, and we've had a lot of table talk in our household about everything that's been going on, and um, there's been lots of conversations for a couple of years, honestly, just because your spirit starts to feel that stirring. You know, you know some stuff is happening. But I think, I think our focus, our main focus, has to be um, digging into our relationship with the Lord. Like, that's going to be the only thing that sustains us as the days go on, you know? And, uh, and not, like Rod said, not... It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have wisdom, you know, and maybe have some preparations. But even that goes back to our relationship with the Lord. Because the Lord might tell one person, I want you to focus on, 
you know, in the natural, a source of water. But he may tell somebody else, I want you to focus on, you know, warmth. You know, you just don't know. Only he knows the connections he's going to make, the people he's going to bring us to, our spiritual family. And, um, and so I think the only way to remain steadfast is to be steadfast in him. And so my encouragement to you, and I've been trying to encourage my children with this, um, is read your Bible. (laughs) Read it. (laughs) Because you can't know him and you can't know his ways if you don't know his words to us, you know. And um, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. You know, and we have the Holy Spirit. I've been studying the oil of the Lord in the Bible, and I've just been blown away by, if you go throughout the Word, the references of the oil in the Word, and all the things that it is to us, and has been for us, and has been. And, and I think it just reminds me of the Holy Spirit, you know. And we got that with Jesus They didn't have that in the Old Testament. We got that. We have him. And so to know his leading and his guiding, we have to know the truth in his word, you know? And so that's just my encouragement. I just, I feel like that's so important and it can't be overlooked amongst all the natural things because like the word says, we do not fight against flesh and blood. That's not where the battle is. This is an eternal thing. And, um, and everything we see in the natural is just movement of what's already happening in the spiritual. The spiritual is really the reality. And that's one place we have to fix our minds. And so I think just staying connected um, with each other and with the Lord, you know, because as times go on, we're going to need each other for different things. And um, yeah, so there's just so much this morning, but I just want to encourage you guys with that. Read your Bible, and um, there's just so many ways we can get it in us. You can listen to it. You can, you know, you can listen to podcasts when you're driving. So it's just a way to get it in you.